This is the earth. We have seen these views and others like them many times. Because of this, we know what the earth looks like. We don't confuse it with pictures of other planets. It is unique. But we often forget that we are the first humans to see this. Perhaps our grandparents saw some of these pictures, but there have been thousands of generations of humans who never knew, like we do now, where we are. You can be told about this, but to see it, you just begin to understand what that means. It is our generation that, for the first time, really understands that we all are earthlings. This is where we are. This is where we are from. This fragile ball of life hanging in the void is shielded and nourished by a paper-thin atmosphere. From space, national boundaries vanish. The conflicts that divide people become invisible. Michael Collins of Apollo 11 said, the thing that really surprised me was that the earth projected an air of fragility. And why, I don't know. I don't know to this day. I had a feeling it's tiny, it's shiny, it's beautiful, it's home, and it's fragile. For the newborn infant, the world is entirely within the senses of his or her own body. Hunger, pain, the touches on her skin, and the smells of her mother and her familiar places. Gradually, the infant becomes aware of sounds and sights around her. As the infant grows, her world expands to her family members and the places she frequents. Through toddlerhood, her world continues to expand gradually. But many toddlers are still fearful of anything and anyone beyond that circle. For many, preschool begins with strong discomfort as it takes the child beyond the comfortable world they are used to. And as the child grows into school age and beyond, the world continues to expand into new and different environments. And humanity as a whole has gone through this same process of growth in the earliest documents and beliefs of all cultures, the world is centered on them. And this is the origin of superstitions that characterize that they are the chosen people, that there is a God that is concerned with their daily lives, what food they should eat, whom they can have sex with, whom they can and cannot kill. This is also the origin of the idea of a savior from God who has been sent to this particular group of people. This is the story of Gilgamesh, Horus, Mithra, Jesus, Muhammad, and many others. They come from many different cultures. These superstitions are the consequence of an infantile understanding of the world that is centered on themselves. Gradually, humanity has expanded its knowledge, but always with a tug back to the childish stories that are so comforting, that makes of us and our particular group something different and something special. When someone says, believe in me and you shall have eternal life, that is a statement of separation. The same notion has been stated by all the old superstitions from many cultures. One of the main points of the Earthlings Project is that we must give up the old superstitions, especially when their main purpose is to divide all people into the us and them groups. I don't know if we are just in our adolescence or beginning adulthood, but we are finding that the early superstitions were not good for humans or the Earth, and we must continue to adulthood and value that which unifies us all and benefits the planet as a whole. To begin with, let's talk about us, about human beings. 
You all know that you have inherited 23 chromosomes from each of your parents. And your parents inherited 23 chromosomes from each of their parents. And all four of your grandparents from their parents, and so forth. Your inheritance doubles in each generation. And if you follow this power of two, you find that just in the 10th century, you would have over 137 billion ancestors more than the number of human beings that have ever lived. So obviously there is lots of duplication as you go back. An ancestor from several generations ago is also the ancestor to others in your family line. It has been said that rather than a family tree, you actually have a family net where different branches have come together several times. The numbers, nevertheless, are truly staggering. If you have any ancestors from Europe, you are related to Charlemagne the Great. He fathered 18 children with two wives and many concubines. It is certain he is your ancestor because you would be related to him hundreds of different ways. Joseph Chang, a statistician from Yale, calculated that the most recent common ancestor of everyone alive today lived only around 3,600 years ago. No matter the language we speak or the color of our skin, we share ancestors who planted rice on the banks of the Yangtze, who first domesticated horses on the steppes of the Ukraine, who hunted giant sloths in the forests of North and South America, and who labored to build the Great Pyramid of Khufu. That we are actually related to everyone on Earth is numerically certain. We seldom think about this, but our family did not just pop into existence at some point in time. But every one of them was born of parents just the way you were, and their parents, and their parents, and so forth. The only way for any of them to exist was that they derived from the earliest Homo sapiens who were robust enough to give birth to surviving children. And so, we are alive today because somehow that long line of our ancestors was able to survive starvation, famines, plagues, pandemics, wars, floods, volcanoes, earthquakes, and every other man-made or natural disaster. And this is true for everyone else living today. Many, perhaps most, did not survive. How do we know about humans in the ancient past? It has to do with DNA. Your DNA is in the nucleus of nearly every cell in your body. The only exception is red blood cells. Your DNA is a composite of the chromosomes of your parents, each of which is a composite of their parents, and so on. However, there is what is called mitochondrial DNA, which is not in the nucleus, but in the cytoplasm of each cell. And the mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from your mother. This means that she has inherited her mitochondrial DNA from her mother and her mother and so on. So clear inheritance lines can be made through the mitochondrial DNA to mothers for many generations. Likewise, the Y chromosome is inherited only from your father and sons will pass that on to their children. If the process of copying the mitochondrial DNA from mother to daughter were perfect, then there would be no change all the way back to the first mother, and likewise every copy of the Y chromosome to the first father. However, occasionally errors are made in the copying process from mother to daughter, called mutations, and so it very gradually changes. There is a change in the mitochondrial DNA, an average of every 3,000 years. This rate of change is called the molecular clock. And it is this molecular clock that enables researchers to date ancient DNA. The more differences there are, the farther apart they are in time. 
What all this means is that these two, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, can be used to identify the mother and father lines and in addition to place them in an approximate time frame based on the molecular clock. Consequently, today archaeologists and paleogeneticists are beginning to discover much about ancient human history, and we now are able to see the movement of human beings throughout the earth through time. <laughs> So, let's start way back. Humans first evolved in Africa, and much of human evolution occurred on that continent. The fossils of early human-like species who lived between six and two million years ago come entirely from Africa. And the genetic evidence is clear. All Homo sapiens descend from a so-called mitochondrial E, in Africa less than 160,000 years ago. That is, there is a single origin for all Homo sapiens. When we talk about tens or hundreds of thousands of years, we recognize that this research is ongoing and that some numbers will likely change in the future. But the consensus currently is Homo sapiens colonized all of Africa 150,000 years ago. They began moving out of Africa around 80,000 years ago and spread across the entire continents of Europe, Asia, and Australia by 40,000 years ago. Due to the lowered sea level exposing the 600 mile wide connection to Alaska, migration to the Americas took place 20,000 to 15,000 years ago. Native Americans occupied the American continents and had reached Patagonia in southern Chile at the tip of South America more than 11,000 miles from Alaska by 12,800 BCE. It is important to remember that all Homo sapiens were hunter-gatherers at this time. Hunter-gatherers were always mobile because their survival required it. If there was a herd of deer over several hills away, you had to go to them. Likewise, if there is an abundance of fruit in a valley far away, it was worth the effort to travel there. And finding that, you start to wonder what is over the next hill. Early migration was typically not a long distance affair but gradually moving a little farther afield each time. And mobility required that they were in small groups typically consisting of only several families. You can also understand how an area that begins to be populated with more and more people and the available food becomes less and less, there is a strong motivation to find some new territory where there is an increase in available food. By 2000 BCE, the entire planet is occupied by Homo sapiens, with the exception of the most remote islands of the Pacific. Despite this, it is just the beginning of human migration. The first migrants who went to each area of the continent did not stay there, but they continued to move to some place else. That is, the genetics from the most ancient bones in a region is different from the genetics of its current residents. For example, there is no connection between current southeastern Asians and the ancient populations that lived there before 15,000 years ago. 24,000 years ago, there was a population living in the steppes area unrelated to the present-day inhabitants of the region. Some from that population moved west into northern Europe, while others migrated east across Siberia and contributed to the population that crossed the Bering Land Bridge and gave rise to Native Americans. DNA evidence also shows that the population of northern Europe was largely replaced by a mass migration from the eastern European steppe after 5,000 years ago. 
agriculture began in Mesopotamia between 12 and 11,000 years ago, where local hunter-gatherers gradually began domesticating various plants and animals. One would think that agriculture would keep people from moving, but it did not. One of the byproducts of agriculture is that the population increases rapidly. More people survive childhood. More people are well-fed. This growth in population is the cause for further migration. After around 9,000 years ago, farming people began spreading west to present-day Greece and east, reaching the Indus Valley in present-day Pakistan. Within Europe, farming people spread west along the Mediterranean coast to Spain and northwest to Germany through the Danube River Valley until they reached Scandinavia in the north and the British Isles in the west. Around the same time, farming began near the Yellow River in northern China, as well as in Mexico and South America. The genetic population of Europe shows that the original hunter-gatherers were not converted to agriculture, but the farmers from the Middle East overran them and became the dominant group in Europe today. Two kinds of migration were created by conquering tribes and armies. The first is the movement of the tribe itself. Many of these marauding conquerors, being mostly male, raped and pillaged as they went, leaving offspring of the local population and themselves. This amalgamation of population groups continues throughout history to the present day. And their aggression creates large numbers of refugees who simply are trying to save their own lives. In addition to small skirmishes between groups from the beginning of time, larger groups begin with the Yamnaya, who on horseback overran parts of Europe and Asia beginning around 3300 BCE. This continues with the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, and the bands of Goths, Huns, and Vandals in the early Middle Ages. And later, the seafaring Vikings, Genghis Khan, and the Mongol Empire. All of these left offspring throughout conquered lands and sometimes remained there as new settlers. Later wars created large numbers of refugees. Napoleon, in the early 19th century, produced over three million refugees. The First and Second World Wars created over 150 million refugees, many to never return to their homes. Religious conflict is another cause of migration. These include conflicts between Christians and Muslims, Muslims and Hindus in Pakistan and India, as well as conflicts between different groups within the same religion, such as the Thirty Years' War between Protestants and Catholic Christians. Conflict between Shia and Sunni Muslims has existed since the 7th century. There are those who migrated against their own will. 12 million Africans were exported across the Atlantic as slaves. Another half million African and Indian slaves were sold in the Indian Ocean region. The world has seen innumerable droughts where the expected rainfall or monsoons do not come for several years and there is no food, causing the residents to flee to where they can raise food. Likewise, floods, earthquakes, or volcanoes cause many to lose their homes and livelihoods. The 19th and early 20th century saw huge waves of emigration from across Europe, Eastern Europe, and Russia moving to the Americas, often at more than one million every year. After emancipation of slavery in the U.S., about six million African Americans migrated from the south to northern industrializing cities. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, 
20 million Chinese emigrated overseas. By 1900, 65,000 Japanese had emigrated to Hawaii, and by the mid-20th century, almost a half million had moved to the American continents. The Industrial Revolution impacted every continent as many millions moved from rural areas to urban centers, continuing even today. And just between 2008 and 2014, floods, storms, earthquakes, and the like forced 26 million people to move each year. Currently, the UN estimates 214 million people live outside of the country of their birth. Almost a quarter of all people in the United States are international immigrants or the children of immigrants. We first noted that we're related to everyone on earth simply because of the huge number of ancestors we each have. And now we have seen the way that the population of the earth has been in continuous circulation, and we are related to everyone because migration has mixed us all together. We are a blend of past populations, each of which was blends themselves. We are alive because our ancestors were able to survive, and in many cases they survived because of migration whether they had to escape oppressive regimes, floods, droughts, wars, or a lack of food, to leave that situation to migrate somewhere else was what enabled them to survive. We are all migrants. How many different skin colors are there? The Pantone Paint Company sponsored photographing human faces and to identify with special instruments the precise shade of skin color. Our children's stories were intended to make us feel that we are somehow better than those who do not look like us, and the most obvious of differences were the different colors of skin and so there became common in our upbringing the concept of races. But now we know that differences in skin color are related to human migration. As Homo sapiens moved from Africa to colder climates, evolution gradually enabled toleration of those climates by influencing their skin color. The darker skin color of humans is affected largely by the pigment melanin. The skin color of people with light skin is determined mainly by the bluish-white connective tissue under the dermis and by the hemoglobin circulating in the veins of the dermis. Melanin is a natural sunscreen that protects tropical peoples from the many harmful effects of ultraviolet rays. Yet, when a certain amount of ultraviolet rays penetrate the skin, it helps the human body use vitamin D to absorb the calcium necessary for strong bones. This delicate balancing act explains why the people who migrated to colder geographic zones with less sunlight developed lighter skin color. As people move to areas farther from the equator with lower ultraviolet levels, Natural selection favored lighter skin, which allowed the ultraviolet rays to penetrate and produce essential vitamin D. Human populations over the past 50,000 years have changed from dark skin to light skinned and vice versa as they migrated across different UV zones, and such major changes in pigmentation can have happened in as little as 100 generations or around 2,500 years. DNA from a 10,000-year-old skeleton discovered near Cheddar Gorge, England, reveals that the first British people had dark brown to black skin and dark curly hair and blue eyes. The first inhabitants of the Americas who crossed the Bering Strait to Alaska were relatively uniform in skin color. Then, as over the next 1,100 years they moved south to inhabit both continents, 
we see how this singular group has resulted in a range of skin colors, with the darkest in the equatorial regions and the lighter at the extremes. Diets rich in seafood enjoy an alternate source of vitamin D. That means that some Arctic people, such as the Inuit, can afford to remain dark-skinned even in low UV areas. Gradually, visually distinct characteristics like color of eyes, hair, or skin came to predominate in certain regions due both to these adaptive mutations as well as to genetic variations that sometimes occur in isolated populations. Even if these variations have no particular adaptive advantage. Similar genetic characteristics occur when there is a small population where mating stays within a small community of people. Human populations have been reduced to a small number of surviving individuals at many times and places during its existence. And so this has been common. Beginning in the 16th century, those who began exporting slaves from one place to another needed to prove that slaves were not humans, but were in fact another species, and as a consequence we saw arguments purporting that they were less than human. And likewise, in the colonial period, Europeans and Americans concocted arguments to show that Africans, Asian, and American Indians, and Southeast Asians were somehow inferior and needed the superior Europeans to take care of them. As recently as 1962, the University of Pennsylvania anthropologist Carlton Kuhn claimed that there had been no prehistoric migrations at all, but a different species of humans arose on each continent separately. He wanted to prove that Europeans were of a different species from the rest, and of course genetics proved him wrong. There are no races. We are all homo sapiens. We are all earthlings. The variations in skin color has been related to our migration to different climates. And migration itself has been motivated by climate itself. Who are you? Your body consists of approximately 100 trillion cells. There are over 200 types of cells which can be placed in 11 different categories. Everything you do, everything, is done by cells. Your beating heart. Your skin your entire digestion system, the functions of your kidneys and liver, the lungs and pulling oxygen out of the air, all movement by way of muscle cells, your bones, all glands and sex organs, all senses, all thinking, all thoughts, all dreams, there is nothing that you do that is not done by cells. And here is what is amazing. All living things on earth consist of cells, bacteria, fungus, algae, protozoa, insects, fish, reptiles, mammals, everything. And, to add to our amazement, all plants are made up of cells also. Grass, trees, flowers, and just like us, everything they do is done by cells. Plant cells have some differences from animal cells. Plant cells have cell walls that provide support and give shape to plants. In addition, plant cells have chloroplasts so that they can perform photosynthesis, enabling them to get energy from the sun. 
Many living things consist of vast numbers of cells working in concert with one another. Nerve cells, for example, have long, thin extensions that can reach for several feet and serve to transmit signals rapidly. Long, tapered muscle cells have an intrinsic stretchiness that allows them to change length within contracting and relaxing muscles. And perhaps the most incredible of all is that the neurons in our brain and their connections give rise to all our thoughts and dreams. And there is one more characteristic to all life on Earth. All living things have DNA within their cells. In fact, every cell in a multicellular organism possesses the full set of DNA required for that organism. DNA is a complex molecule. Deoxyribonucleic acid. It consists of four bases, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. These strands are bound together according to base pairing rules, adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. These are the same four for all living things in the same structure. I lose my breath when I think about this. These four are the same for all living things in the double helix structure. What differs is the order as well as the total number of these base pairs. And consider this, all living things on Earth have DNA in every one of their cells. Everything. All mammals. All reptiles. All fish. All insects. All fungus. All bacteria. All trees. All grasses. All flowers everything in the plant kingdom. There are some viruses that contain only RNA, which is like DNA but which has only a single strand. Humans share more than 50% of the genetic sequences with plants and animals in general. They share about 80% with cows, 61% with fruit flies. Look at the great diversity of all life. And it is beyond amazing that all this diversity is based on this single plan of cells and that incredible molecule DNA. This shows us the overwhelming degree of relatedness that we humans have to all other life on this planet. We see that this is no accident when we look at the evolution of life on the Earth and how it is related to the history of the planet's formation, its heating and its cooling. The atmosphere of the early Earth did not have oxygen, but cyanobacteria created oxygen as a waste product. This oxygen was originally absorbed by iron in the oceans, but when they were saturated the oxygen started to be expelled into the atmosphere. Oxygen was toxic to much of bacterial life that existed at that time, and this marks the first and perhaps the greatest extinction at about two billion years ago. However, this was the change in the Earth's atmosphere that gave rise to new organisms that needed oxygen to exist and, of course, started a long evolution that included dinosaurs, birds, other reptiles, mammals, primates, and, eventually, us. The universality of DNA is evidence that all life on Earth began with some simple version of DNA from which all life has evolved. A 2018 study places this shortly after 4.2 billion years ago, a few hundred million years before the earliest fossil evidence of life, even though he knew nothing about DNA. Charles Darwin stated this hypothesis in 1859. Quote, All the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth 
have descended from some one primordial form into which life was first breathed. We do not know if there is DNA in any other place in the universe, but we know that is how things work on this planet. It is what makes all of us earthlings. The old mythologies spoke about humans descending from the angels and that we are distinguished by having some indefinable thing called soul. We now know that this was just another childish story, grown out of ignorance, and that we, like all animals, are from this earth. Earth born and made to live on the earth. It is the old mythologies that make us feel superior that told us we had permission to demean the earth, to have dominion over all animals, and to free us to treat them as somehow unworthy. This is what the Earthlings Project is all about. We are from the earth. We are the products of what the earth is and how it works. The earth and its climates its family of organisms, plants, insects, and animals have made us who we are. We now know we are all migrants, and by necessity, plants and animals are also migrants. There are no races. We are all one human species related to one another. We are related to all animals and plants by the way we all partake of the common structures of life on this planet. Things are not the way they used to be. For generations on end, the number of humans on Earth were so few that we did not make a global impact on the earth. We could devastate local areas by fires, over farming, and other overuse. But now, there are so many of us that we are in danger of using up the resources of the earth. We are now in danger of spoiling the air and water with our pollutants and garbage. With small numbers, and without machines fueled by fossil fuels, we had no danger of filling the air with substances that would overwhelm the atmosphere around the Earth. No longer. From the earliest history, there have always been epidemics and plagues. But they went as far as a coastline, or were limited by the short distances that people could travel. But no more. With humans, occupying every continent and island on the earth and with rapid transportation between them all, pathogens now can move across the globe quickly without stopping. Evolution guarantees that new mutations of viruses and other pathogens will come into existence. We have seen how religions, tribes, and nations have been the source of wars and oppression, of prejudice and hatred, and how they try to magnify their differences. The differences will always be part of our existence, but as we grow out of our childhood, we see that these differences are almost insignificant in comparison to what is common to us all, that we are all earthlings. There are still those who believe that there is some great spirit that is going to save us from ourselves. We can forgive them for their childish myths and stories, which simply grew out of ignorance, but we cannot continue to hold on to these. It is time to grow up, because our lives and our future depend on it. We must break down the imagined divisions and stories that separate. This will take a long time and oh so gradual, but we must begin. 
We are connected to all plants, animals, birds, insects. We are connected to the air, the water, the rocks and soil on this planet. We all are earthlings. When we understand this, we see that there is no greater purpose than what must be done for this planet. It is more important than any nation, religion, or other division that we often seem to put first. And that requires, first of all, that we change our mindset about where we are, who we are, and where we are from. And when we translate this understanding to our innermost feelings, it results in compassion for the earth and all its beings, affection for its many places and its ways, and a genuine feeling that it is a privilege to live here. And here is another picture taken of the earth more than 30 years ago, taken from 3.7 billion miles away. We need to look again at that dot and to listen again to these words of Carl Sagan. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. On a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. <laughs>